to everybody. Welcome to our March edition of the Gray Area. And before we get started introducing our panel for today, I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping about how this interactive session today will be taking place. I'm going to do a quick sc uh, screen share here and show you that the way you will type in your questions, I see a couple of you have already, I'll look at them in just a moment. You're going to use the Q&A icon on the bottom center of your screen. You can type them in at any time and we'll get to them as, as we can, depending on where we are in the program. And in addition, the chat has been disabled. Uh, that just gets a little chaotic. So we're going to stick with the Q&A. And then towards the end of the program, after we cover a lot of the, some of the main topics today and some of the items that we're going to go over, we will then have audience participation where you can use the little hand raising icon also on the bottom center of your screen. Raise your hand, we'll call on you, but that'll be a little bit later. And that will just enable your microphone. You still won't be seen, so no worries there if that's something that concerns you. It's kind of like a radio show, so we'll, we'll just uh, enable your microphone. And one other item to mention before we uh, proceed and I introduce everybody here today, I want to mention that what you're going to hear today are it's the opinions of our panel, okay? Your documents of your associations are what rules, okay? So the information today is strictly the opinion of our speakers. It is not to be considered legal advice. If you, uh, it's opinions and how maybe how we've handled things in the past. Seek your association counsel if you are needing to, to do something. That is always a golden rule of thumb there. So without further ado, I want to introduce today first our host, Fred Gray. Fred uh, is the owner and president of Gray Systems, and he's been in the continuing education industry since the mid-70s, started his career uh, in, with the National uh, Association of Realtors, and as an educator, he became involved with the Community Association and Manager Education Program even before the law was adopted by the state of Florida in 1988. So Fred helped write the book. Fred, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literal. <laughs> and, um, and then our guest today is a professional community association manager. His name is Bruce Bandler. He began at Winmore 31 years ago after holding the position of the CFO at a five-star hotel and resort for 13 years. Bruce was Winmore CFO for 16 years and then promoted to the administrator for over the past 15 years and counting, and he's still smiling. So that, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> Bruce has seen it all, and today he agreed to share with us some issues and thoughts that directly or indirectly may be of interest to all of you as CAMs and board members. So uh, I wanna welcome uh, Bruce to the program, and uh, Bruce will be introducing another guest in a little while. But for now, Fred, I wanna turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff, for have, uh, having us here, getting started here. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today and also particularly Bruce for joining us. I had the privilege of meeting Bruce uh, in the very beginning of all of his career as well and kind of watched every as we could, we've gone along as well. I want to emphasize something that Jeff said a moment ago. Uh, this is an information program. We're not giving legal advice. I'm an educator. Bruce is a manager. We're sharing experiences and what we've seen in the field as we go through. Uh, Jeff did solicit questions from you when we had to sign up. I have those questions in front of me here. I'm going to try to summarize some of those as we go through. Uh, and Bruce and I are going to talk about the various topics that we had and our uh, information that we sent out about the uh, roundtable as well. And we do welcome your uh, participation. That's one of the reasons that we're doing this as well. Uh, so we can get people's uh, input, thoughts, and address your issues. Uh, also, I want to mention something that's a very important, and Jeff mentioned also, uh, the answers to a lot of the questions that we saw are in your documents. Uh, the documents of your community association control, everything that happens there. I like to, even though my legal, legal friends hate it when I say this, I like to compare the community association world uh, to the government world. It's kind of like a mini government. If you live in a city or a county or a state of the United States, we're governed by those ordinances, laws uh, of uh, the states, the government, whatever it might be. Our documents are the same thing. Uh, when you have those questions, what can we do? What can we, we not do? Go
go back to your documents. Uh, where we have problems or issues that you want to address, it almost always requires an amendment to the documents uh, to cover that as well. Uh, and so I kind of keep emphasize that as we start out here as well. And uh, uh, Bruce brought up a couple of things in our earlier discussion before we came uh, on live here that I uh, want to touch, touch on that are not in our bulleted points there. Uh, Bruce talked about the issue of uh, term limits for condominiums. Uh, there was language passed a couple of years ago uh, that uh, uh, says that the board members can only serve eight consecutive years. Uh, the question was, when does that go into effect or when does the limit start? And the, uh, it is not codified yet, but, the, uh, but basically the interpretation is it starts with terms served beginning after June 30th, 2018. Everything served before July 1, 2018 doesn't count. Uh, so you start accumulating July 1, 2018, moving forward. That is in legislation this year. It's not passed yet, but there is an, in a bill that uh, is in, being considered in the House right now uh, that will uh, codify that as well and clarify that. Also, I have a, I have a comment on term limits, uh, and I, I'm probably uh, one of the people that are opposed to term limits in any case at all. Uh, even in the legislature, the Congress, whatever, I know sometimes it seems like these people take office, uh, they uh, limit, uh, uh, they get concerned about people staying in there too long, controlling everything. But my observation is having spent a lot of time in the uh, legislative process, not as a legislator, but working on lobbying and laws uh, throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s, I kind you, of, you might have done one or two. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, I kind of exited in the, uh, in the 2000s. But uh, it takes a while for people to learn what they're doing. And if you tell somebody they can only serve two or three years or whatever it might be, by the time they learn what they're doing, we kick them out. Uh, and to me, uh, having experience sometimes is uh, well uh, meaning for the community and also for our governments as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of opposed to term limits for that reason. Also, I recognize that there are abuses. There are people who take advantage of it, but uh, still, that's my thought as well. Uh, Bruce, do you have any comments about that? Uh, thank you, Fred, for having me. And uh, hello to everybody in Grayland and all your managers and directors. Grayland. I didn't get to see you in uh, Grayland. But uh, talking about term limits, I agree with uh, Fred also. I'm against term limits. We get good people in an office and because of a certain amount of time they have to leave and who takes their place and who created the term limits? It's usually people that can't get elected. We have two safeguards. One is the voting process and number two is the division of uh, business regulation. If someone's not doing right, they should be removed. But just because you served a certain amount of time, I don't think that's nece necessary to have somebody removed. These are good people, they are, they are experienced, and we found that they are replaced by more of a rebel type that really couldn't get elected by their people. And uh, it really does have an effect on the community. So, so what do you do? That spawns a thought, actually. This is good stuff. What do you do if you're a disgruntled homeowner in a condo or an HOA or, or a cooperative and you're not happy with how things are going? Or so you try to run for the board yourself, right? Right. And there's a difference right. between disgruntled and being somebody that is just trying to change the system. Right. For their own purposes they may have their own agenda uh and uh that's what we that's what i have found from my personal experience well, I'll also a comment about that jeff and bruce uh people don't run for positions because they're they're happy with what's going on uh quite often uh they do run with agendas they do feel they can do something better uh they do feel they can prove uh, the operations the community whatever it might be now i recognize there are people that have uh, a contrary agenda as well. Uh, they may not like what's going on because it doesn't fit into their lifestyle, whatever it might be. But for the most part, my experience has been, my observation that people who run for the board or run for office of any type are running with the idea of improving, making things better uh, and trying to do a good job. Uh, and I like to think about that as well. And if they're doing a good job, uh, why would you want them to leave? Uh, I know I, I, I've been, I had the pleasure of serving on our city commission here at the town I live in, a small town in Central Florida. We don't tell anybody where it is, uh, so don't come see us. But uh, one of the worst four years I ever had in my life uh, uh, serving on city commission, 
uh, because I wanted to change things. And we did. Uh, we thought we improved our community. Uh, we did good things. We raised taxes. Well, also by raising taxes, we were able to uh, provide for maintenance and do other things like it as well. Uh, and all that was uh, part of the process. Uh, and uh, I won't ever do it again, but uh, uh, I, I will support the people that are running. And I think we all should look at that as well. Also, one thing I wanted to mention real quickly is manager. Uh, managers should stay out of the politics of the association. Uh, we should not be promoting uh, one person over another as a board member. I know a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago now, I had some uh, friend manager students uh, that were uh, disciplined because they got involved in the election process and began promoting uh, certain people for the board and it, uh, they got fines from the state. Uh, we should be neutral in that regard. Uh, our voice is to express what the, what the board wants us to do. And we work at the pleasure of the board and we, we give them guidance and direction, but they tell us what to do. And I mentioned that as part of that as well. Uh, but um, that's uh, one of the issues about uh, term limits here as well. Uh, also, I wanted to move on, Bruce, uh, one of the things, uh, when we solicited questions when we had, did the registration for this, we had a number of questions related to uh, the over 55 communities. And I would like to start with Bruce's experience. He's working in a community that's more than 40 years old, and it was one of the original, quote, retirement communities that was set up to accommodate retirement at that time. Uh, it evolved into today an over 55 community, and uh, it's kind of uh, how, how that's all evolved. And I'd like to, Bruce, you, I think, uh, Shaquille, you can share a, a little video with us. That's kind of interesting to see how this has evolved. Bruce, you want to introduce that? Yeah, first, I want to introduce Jakia. She's our director of recreation and entertainment. She's my Zoom master. And I asked her to come on today to put these couple of exhibits on for me so that uh, we can share them with you and the public. Now, these are going back. There's two videos. They're about a half a minute each. Right, Jakia, we have two? Correct. Good morning. Uh, and this is late 70s up to 1981. So there's the two videos, and we'll make our point after we watch the video. Midway between Miami and Palm Beach is Florida's most beautiful adult community. Winmore is what Florida living's all about. Sunshine, water, swaying palms, and lots of open space. More important, all those exciting Winmore activities to keep you active, secure, and happy. Find out about Winmore for yourself. Call toll-free, day or night, 800-327-8985. 800-327-8985. What happens if we call that number now? <laughs> you can do it on your cell phone. There's no cell phone back there. Statement is the Winmore way of life. Winmore, beautiful inside and out because of the people who live here. Winmore, where our spacious apartment homes are still affordable. Why wait? Find out about Winmore. Call now, toll free, 800 327 8985. That's 800 327 8985. Selling a lifestyle. Yeah. Now, what did you observe here? You observed people enjoying themselves. That was unusual. <laughs> okay. And uh, this goes back uh, 30, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. And um, it was a different time. It was people retired at the age of 62. That was the magic number of Social Security. They got their pension because either they worked in education or the company. Or they had their business, they sold it, they sold their big home up north, and they were going to live down here for the rest of their life on that income. They were going to have their two cruises a year, go to their shows on Saturday night, play golf with their buddies in the morning, and go to dinner with their friends and family. At, and, and that was it, okay? And that was the lifestyle, and that's what uh, the Housing for Older Persons Act was supposed to be for. Um, so what happens? Our community now is 40 years old. We've seen about four different generations of people and lifestyles have changed. As you can imagine back then, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't even have compact discs. Okay, we're way past that. So it was a different lifestyle. It was a relaxed lifestyle. People had one car uh, and uh, that's what they were expecting. Times change. People are now working to a later age. Uh, their children, uh, maybe has a problem with uh, 
uh, employment are now staying with them to save money. So now we have people under 55, but over 18 living in these units, uh, which creates a different type of demographic. And uh, we see different things. And uh, I, I come in the gate at seven o'clock in the morning, we have a security gate, and I see more people coming out than coming in because they're going to work. Going so to work. it's a different lifestyle and we need to adapt to that. Now, Fred and I were talking earlier about the villages. I think the villages are in generation number one right now. So they're almost a reflection that we were back in 1980, where again, people, this is their first retirement. This is their retirement home. Uh, they're the first ones in there. Uh, everything's starting off brand new with brand new facilities. And it's, it's a different lifestyle. Right now, uh, we're trying to create more. We're improving, improving on what we have. We're cutting and pasting as opposed to where you could just start brand new from the ground up. So we have our different issues versus these newer communities. And it's really uh, the demographics, the people, and uh, it's different than just retirement. It's, a way, it's people are working. Could I live there? I'm not quite. Oh yeah, that. Jeff. Jeff would have a problem, and uh, it's funny uh, with some of the laws. And uh, Fred always says, "Go back to your documents." But Fred is uh, Jeff is a good citizen. He's under 55. He can buy here, but he can't live here unless he's living with somebody who's over the age of 55. And I would think that if this law did not go through the Housing for Older Persons Act back in the uh, 70s and uh, amended in 1995, hey. that uh, Fred, did you write that law? Yeah, no. Fred, did you? Yeah, no, Fred was there. <laughs> okay, I, I would think that if there was no 55 and they tried to start a 55 community today, and Jeff came up and said you're discriminating against me because of age, I think it would be very difficult to create this lifestyle. So we're trying to continue our lifestyle. We know that we have to amend it because of the change in society. But uh, it puts a lot of stress on us as managers. The Fair Housing Act changed this whole uh, lifestyle. The communities like yours that were built back in the 70s and 80s, they could say no children. Uh, that was a prohibition that was in their documents when they passed the, uh, the amendments to the Fair Housing Act, uh, prohibiting uh, uh, familial status as grounds for denial for somebody to move in. That meant you couldn't refuse to uh, allow somebody to live there, had to have children under the age of 18. Uh, because of the retirement communities lobbying, that's why they put in the ex exemptions from the uh, familial status provisions in the law. If you have a community where 100% of the residents are age 62 or over, you can prohibit children or families with children. Uh, if you have a community where 80% of the units have at least one occupant age 55 or over, you can also prohibit for families with children under the age of 18. Uh, so that's where most of the communities in Florida have qualified the 80% one occupant age 55 or over. Some like Winmore require 100% to have one occupant age 55 or over. Uh, most of the communities you go with the 80% because that leaves you a 20% cushion in there where you could allow people in Jeff's category uh, to live there uh, who aren't 55 or of so some point in time, they're going to roll over and achieve that status as well. Gives you a little more flexibility. The main key is you have to have provisions that say you know, that children under the age of 18 can't live there. Now, we've got the uh, issue that uh, Bruce brought up because of economics and other problems, uh, the economy. We have uh, displaced uh, families uh, who are moving in. They're yeah. over 18, but they're, they're moving in with their parents or or surviving parent, whatever it might be, and that's bringing a younger element in. It's much easier today when you start those communities that uh, do have one occupant age 55 or over as well. Those that are managing the communities that are qualified, trying to qualify under the Fair Housing Act exemptions, you must maintain documentation that you meet the requirements for the exemptions either 100% age 50, 62 or over, or at least one occupant age 55 or over. That means that you usually on an annual basis do a census, uh, you visit all your residents, you get copies of a driver's license or birth certificate or a passport or some document that verifies the age of the people that are qualifying that unit. Uh, that's one of the requirements to qualify. If, if you ever challenge somebody wants to move in, 
uh, that's not 55, they file a complaint with the uh, Housing and Urban Development, they're going to investigate. That's when you have to come back and prove that. Jeff, you're- Yeah, that, that's a tricky area too. And there's an interesting question on here from, from one of our uh, lis listeners today regarding the 55 and over communities. Monitoring the ages for requiring for the reporting, how do you do that? Just what I said, you do a census. Uh, yeah, but on, on, ongoing, ongoing. I, I think Jeff, the, the, way, the, way I'm, the way I'm <laughs> reading the question is, you know, everybody knows that if there's a, a speed limit sign that says 25 miles an hour, you're going to drive 35 miles an hour. So, so what? I, and what I mean by that is, regarding these communities, how do you monitor the ages after the fact? How do you? What What are some other things you yeah, can do? We have a database, and everybody that lives here has to be registered with their birth in it. So we run the reports. In our cases, Fred said everyone has to be over uh, 55. But if you have a database, I'm sure the state would want to look at it to say, let's see the percentages that you have. But when somebody's living there, they have to be uh, an occupant. And that's how you get the data. Most of the communities is part of the purchase price pr purchase process now. Uh, the real estate world knows that there are these restrictions in the documents. So they, on the front end, when you're buying there, you have to provide documentation that you qualify. Now, after you're qualified, if somebody else, you sell the unit, whatever it might be, they're going to go through that same process. Uh, most of these communities uh, that are organized originally uh, as the age-restricted communities, the proper terminology, I think, or housing for older persons, have that in their documents. And then in order to qualify to live there, you've got to meet the requirements of those documents. And you have some sort of approval process that you have to go through. Now, it's up to management to maintain that documentation. Uh, but again, if you're ever challenged in the future uh, by somebody that wants to move in uh, and you're denied because they don't have one occupant age 55 or over, or in Bruce's case, everybody 55 or over uh, as, a, as an owner, then- or At as least a, one person, one person has to be. As a resident, uh, person age 55 or over. But, but Fred, we need the database for those for 18 and over all sides. Okay. Well, so, you maintain you can you maintain all those records. The, the issue is there has to be some process in place, whether it's an approved yeah. process or at the purchase, whatever, that we document that, and then we maintain that. And every transaction after that is also documented. Uh, because again, if HUD challenges, we've got to be able to prove that. Okay. So, th th and that's that's actually very interesting segue into something else that, that we want to talk about today too. <laughs> So I'm 55, I own there, but I don't want to live there yet. Can I rent it out? Can I rent uh, it out to somebody who's under 55? Tell you, Fred, documents. In our case, uh, Jeff, in our documents, we have a rental restriction. Okay. You can only rent out for a limit of six months. And we're going to get into that I think, a little bit later with the uh, Airbnb and the, uh, the vacation rentals. And uh, you could put restrictions in there. We found that a lot of people were buying here for investment properties and our community was getting very transient. So many of the associations uh, put in a two year rule that if you buy, you can't rent for the first two years to, to discourage people from renting. All right, so you have, to own it for two years. you have to own it for two years before you can start renting, before yeah. you can start renting it out, okay. Yeah. And then we also had a only a certain percentage of the building could be rented. So let's say, uh, the level is 20%. We didn't want more than 20% per building because again, this is a community. You don't want to be considered transient, whether it's on a short-term basis or, or a long, well, little bit longer. Well, that also takes me into another direction, Jeff, you were mentioned there. Uh, restrictions on rentals, uh, short-term occupancy. It goes into the Airbnb, uh, vacation rental by owner issue as well. Uh, and uh, I own my unit. Don't tell me what to do. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, go, that goes back to the documents. I can't emphasize enough the documents. If you're going to place any restrictions on the person's right to do with their unit what they want to do, it has to be in your documents. Now, can you amend your documents to restrict rentals? For condominiums? Yes, you can. However, if you amend your documents today to restrict rentals, those restrictions only apply to those who vote for the amendment. Anybody who votes against the amendment, it doesn't apply to them. 
it would apply to their successor owners. It wouldn't apply to them. So if I'm in a condominium right now, I have my unit with Airbnb. There are no restrictions in the documents that uh, limit that. And now you want to amend the documents to prohibit that. All I'm going to do is vote against that amendment. And I can continue renting my unit out on a nightly basis or a weekly basis or whatever I've been doing. That's a problem. We recognize that. And it's becoming more of a problem as it becomes more more and more popular. Uh, we ran into it uh, in our little town that I live in. I didn't know it, but a friend of ours passed away or her children inherited the house. And all of a sudden we see strange cars there all the time. So I got on the internet and there it is. It's on Airbnb. Uh, they're now become friends of ours, but uh, it's a block away from my house. Uh, I wasn't really excited about that, but uh, anyway, that happens. Uh, again, everything re relies on your documents. Also, I'd like to mention on the short-term rental thing, it was further down on our list here, but we'll move into that now. Uh, the state is considering uh, uh, taking jurisdiction on short-term rentals uh, and subrogating these uh, local jurisdictions to state regulation. Uh, the operators of the short-term rental companies are lobbying the state to do that because right now, if you want, if Airbnb wants, or if you live in uh, Broward County and you want to uh, put your unit on Airbnb, you comply with the Broward County ordinances. The state doesn't get involved. Uh, they also want to make sure that they collect the sales tax on those uh, rentals as well. Uh, Airbnb wants to be not regulated by local governments, they want to be regulated by the states. They have one uh, re regulation to go through. Uh, this is one of the areas that we are watching closely uh, from the legislative side as well, because this is going to impact uh, community associations of all types. Uh, and the big issue is if you, if you want to regulate that activity, you're going to have to do something in your documents. Also, uh, I would mention there's uh, legislation proposed that would prohibit uh, uh, HOA put, uh, put the same limitation on HOAs about the uh, short uh, rental restrictions as well. Rental restrictions would only apply to those who voted for it uh, and not against it. So those are issues that are of concern as well, uh, legislative issues down the road. And unfortunately, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about it unless you have some sort of restrictions in your documents as well. Uh, there we go. And Bruce, Bruce apparently, uh, came in before all this. They anticipated uh, these uh, pro problems in the future, and they do have those restrictions on rentals no less than six months. And also, you can't rent until you've owned at least two years. And that takes that property out of the uh, the investment uh, arena as well. I'm just worried that the lobbying of the Airbnb will try to supersede the documents and say that uh, that no longer is... Uh to us. That, that is true as well. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at, looking at, that was one of our items for discussion on our list. Uh, and uh, there's not a whole lot we can say about it. That it goes back to the document issue as well in that respect. Uh, and uh, what we can do about that as well. And also the, the occupancy approval. Uh, I would like to mention something about occupancy approval. Uh, most of our uh, uh, cities and counties now have what they call occupancy limits uh, based on the bedroom units in a uh, facility, a house or a condominium, whatever. Uh, you need to check with your local governments and see how many occup occupants can be in one uh, residential unit. Uh, I know we get some questions about, I've got a three bedroom unit and there are 14 people living there. Uh, can we restrict that? That issue, I think, would revert back to your local governments right now. But we made that a document issue. We yeah. have a limit on it in our document. And that's, again, you you answered the, you saw the problem by going back to the documents. That's what I started out our conversation with. I think uh, there's a, yeah, there's a theme here. Uh, the yeah. documents rule. <laughs> yeah. You want to answer Fred, you just say it's in the documents and then <laughs> the next topic. <laughs> That's the easiest way to train new community association managers. Check what is it? What do the documents say? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I want to skip back because I know I jumped ahead a little bit and go back. Um, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this because a lot of these um, issues uh, are very, very specific to your associations. But um, I see here when we were talking about 55 plus communities, I also uh, bundled in there the pets versus ESAs. Just briefly, briefly, briefly. 
because uh, we know we could spend all day on this. Um, Bruce, go, uh, how have you combated that? How, what, what's happening down over on a larger scale community like yours? We try you to do our best that all the uh, emotional pets, and we, we have no pet policy. So we're talking about support animals and emotional support pets. They all have to be registered with us. And they have to, that, we have to make sure they have their shots and, and, and do things like that. But our hands are primarily tied. And uh, the only concerns we have is really with the restrictions on the, uh, the size, the breed, the species, and, and those type of regulations. We've had instances here where people have had pit bulls and one pit bull killed another person's emotional pet. And uh, do we really need pit bulls as emotional pets? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, that's something that we're looking into. And um, Fred mentioned it before about uh, people that moved in. Uh, well, we took this offline. I moved in here, I have allergies. Now, to dogs, what are my rights? Well, really, that hasn't been addressed yet by anybody. And uh, people are scared of particular animals. They moved here because it was a no pet rule. And we're just doing the best we can. We hope that we have responsible people, but some people, use the system. And Fred, you had a confession to us earlier about how you got registered for your emotional support animal. Would you like to share that with the group? Uh, a, little bit, a little real quick background here, where this comes from, the emotional support animal that came up about 10, 12, 14, some 14 years ago, sometime. Uh, when, they, when the uh, Congress passed some amendments to the Fair Housing Act, uh, prohibiting discrimination based on handicap. A handicap is a disability that affects a person's major life activities. Uh, somewhere along the way, somebody with a mental issue uh, received uh, uh, a guest recommendation from their doctor that a dog would help them with their, whatever they had, anxiety, depression, whatever it might be. And that person acquired a dog, that person lived in a condominium that prohibited animals, and they moved in with their animal and the, uh, their chef's dog, dog and they <laughs> make, and they, uh, they, uh, they prevailed when HUD got involved. Uh, when they got, HUD got involved and said, if you have a, a I'm gonna say a pr prescription from a qualified individual that says you need this animal to assist you with your disability, then the, housing authority or the housing entity, in this case, the condominium association, or now the HOA, whatever it might be, can't prohibit you from having that animal. Great right. question for you. What, what if it's my chiropractor who also has doctor in front of his or her name? <laughs> Social workers too, Jeff. That's, that's been the problem, okay? HUD was very liberal it went with, the, with the term qualified individual. And <laughs> anyway, after this became an issue, and we began talking about it in our uh, classes and our educational programs and everywhere else, uh, just uh, to see what was going on, I went on the internet, and uh, this was probably 10 years ago or more, I found a website that said, if you feel like you might benefit from an, um, at that time, I think it was called a comfort animal, uh, uh, or companion animal was the term that they used, uh, filled out this form, so I filled it out. And they wrote me back an email and said, you would probably benefit. And for, if you'll send us $45 or $25 or something like that, uh, we will be sending you a prescription. And they did. And I got a prescription. They, they sent me in and said, what kind of animal would you like? So I sent them a picture of my dog and I got a prescription back from my dog. Uh, and so that was, that's how easy it was. And that's, that's the abusive part. I don't, yeah. I don't agree with that. Now, HUD, last year, 2020, did issue some new guidance on the emotional support animal. Also, Florida, the governor, not the governor, the legislature, somebody wrote a question, the governor's new ESA uh, regulation, that was the legislature regulation. The state of Florida has gotten more restrictive on what qualifies as a, an emotional support animal. And the bottom line is today, if you can prove, have documentation, from a medical professional in Florida, that's the term they use in the Florida law, that says you will benefit from having this animal, then the same <clears throat> prohibitions apply. And the community association documents can't prohibit you from having that animal. 
If you want more than one animal, you have to have documentation for each uh, animal as well. And in Florida, they do use the language uh, medical professional. They also have language in the Florida law that says you have to have been have visited this medical professional. Uh, and that could include uh, uh, by telephone as well. We do that now for, for allow Florida allows uh, remote medical treatments as well. Uh, my last physical that I had from my doctor, I did using uh, Zoom. Uh, they sent me a link. I went in and the doctor was there. We went through the same thing we do in his office every day, except I had to take my own blood pressure and show him my machine. And I had to show him my thermometer. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I was traveling to his office, sitting there with all the other sick people uh, waiting to get a physical. So now I did it right here where I am right now, sitting in front of my computer in my office, at my home. Uh, we do this from my home rather than my office now as well. Uh, so this is moving forward. I think the government is get, getting more restrictive on this, more realistic. Uh, I personally don't have a problem with somebody who ha has a need that uh, they'd be allowed to have an animal as well. It's like the service animal. Service animals have been recognized uh, for years and years and years. Those yeah. who need that animal to exist today. Now. Opinion time, opinion time, okay? Do you think, and this is for both of you, do the, do the new ESA laws slightly favor the associations or the dog owners? What do you think? When you say new, you mean the current? Yeah, what, what's in effect now? It's definitely the, uh, the owner of the dog. The associations, again, if they're not gonna regulate the breed, the size of the animal, or the way the method of who's uh, giving out the prescription limit that uh, I, I think it's open think... field and, and it's our job to maintain our property and in our case our property was not built for pets because again i showed you the video it was a different world back then and, uh, we have yeah, and, and before before i want to get fred's response too i know he's got a response to that it's different like for instance if you have a new build a newer place that's being constructed today, you can build that extra elevator down, down the corridor. You can build that extra this, that extra that. Communities that were built 40, 50, 60 years ago, like Bruce is saying, a little bit stuck. Fred, I don't want to get uh, off the topic, but another situation is like with smoking. If you move into a no smoking building, that's different than trying to convert your current people into converting that right. inside your unit that they can't smoke. So similar situation. Very similar. Fred, how are you going to respond to the ESA? I'm going, I'm going to uh, go a little different direction. I think the new ESA regulations, both federal and state, benefit the people who need the ESA. Hmm. Okay. Now, the, the, the objective here is if a person has a disability, a handicap, and the animal will benefit them, they should be allowed to have it. Okay. Not to the detriment of the community, uh, not to the detriment of their neighbors, but if they have a true benefit. That's the whole objective of this process here. First started by HUD, the states now got involved as well. I'm, not, I'm concerned about uh, HUD taking precedence over some of the state guidance as well. But as I said, in our open discussions, if a person truly needs the animal, they should be allowed to have the animal. Now, sometimes that's not fair, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Bruce, to your neighbor, who may be allergic to the cat. If I'm allowed to have a cat because it comforts me, now my neighbor can't come out in the hall because they're allergic to the cat. There's gotta be a trade off here. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say from the regulator's perspective, HUD, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, they are very aware of these inequities. They're trying to do what they can to make it equitable for everybody. Yeah. But like everything else, it doesn't work. The thing that you mentioned, smoking. Uh, uh, when I grew up, everybody smoked. Uh, now it's the opposite. People don't smoke. If you live in a building where you don't smoke, but there's a smoker in there, uh, you can prohibit smoking, but not within the unit. Okay? So there you've got a problem. They can continue to smoke inside their unit. And what happens if they go out on their balcony and they're smoking, and the smoke rises to the unit above, and that uh, interferes with their lifestyle? Those are inequities and there's not a lot we can do about it. Uh, we, we, I don't wanna say uh, that we can't do anything about it, but we, um, uh, or, or, you know, 
uh, we can't solve everybody, everybody's problem. Well, we just had a uh, board that went to their people, their membership, and wanted to vote that at this point in time to make it no smoking, even in the unit. And it created a large controversy and uh, most people would be grandfathered in, but there's just so many complications to it. I, I really don't see that happening. Uh, just a delicate issue. Right. Yeah, and then, then you have situations where you don't have a, a well-trained service dog, which raises a red flag right away because they're supposed to be specifically you know, trained in certain ways. Like a service dog that keeps barking every time the owner goes away, a service dog with angst, a service dog that needs a, a, an emotional sp support pet for itself, a dog that keeps barking every time the owner goes away. I mean, you have issues, noise issues, you have all kinds of not picking up the poop. So it, it's a very touchy situation. It is. Our experience, we've had no problem with security animals. We've been well trained. And it's just it's the opposite. The, 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 I like, I want to, I'm not, I'm not going to stay on this topic much longer. I also want to, we want, everybody should distinguish between a service animal and an emotional support animal. Yes. This animal is an animal that has gone through specific training. It takes two years for a dog to qualify as a service animal. Uh, and they are trained to assist a person with a specific disability, whether it's hearing, sight. Now they have the epileptic seizure animals. Uh, I've uh, what was the other one? The new one came out. But those those are service animals. The emotional support animal doesn't have to demonstrate any training. Obviously, they've got to be under control of the person that they're serving. serving uh, emotional service, emotional support, supporting, I guess, better term. But everybody should distinguish between those two terms when they're talking about the animals. Right. Okay. Right. So, now, that's a very, very fair point. And I know, uh, again, we could talk about this all day. There's so many specific issues. And even some of the questions on here that earlier were a little bit too specific. Um, but we'll get to your input later, I promise. Once we cover these topics, we're going to open the audience up. You could even voice your questions. I want to go back to the short-term rental thing since we began that a little bit early, but there is an awesome question in here that I, that I want to address that light bulb went off here. Okay, this person says, RCCR state that there are no professions or businesses allowed on the property, meaning you can't run a business from your unit. And you see where I'm going with this. Right. If, you're, if your documents say you can't run a business from your, from your home, you, know, you buy into a condo, you buy by the, by the rules of the condo, is an Airbnb considered a business if the owner wants to do a short-term rental? Jeff, like there, are some, there are some businesses, you can run businesses out of your unit, okay? Like, that's, that's what you do if you lived in a condominium. What you're doing is you're running it. You just have to get a license from the city, but they, they're all... But you, see, you see, like, the, the confusion yeah, there? Residential versus commercial. But it's not like... Yeah, you can make that's that a, argument. A great point. It's a great yeah, point. But, but it's not like a business where people are coming to your door and, and, and whatever. You can run businesses out of your unit and get a license from the city. So uh, you could challenge this one, but I, I think it's probably been challenged already. I, I think using that language, if, if it's in your CCRs, uh, you can't run a business out of your home or your unit or whatever. And using that to prohibit an Airbnb uh, could be uh, applied. Uh, Probably going to require some legal action to do that. Uh, or, which, which we are not here to do. We're just, again, we're expressing opinions and thoughts. <laughs> and I, I want to express another uh, broad opinion. And this is what I hear all the time. And we get these questions what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Or the board say, what can I do about this person who's not doing what they're supposed to do? And the thing that I call, always come back with them is to take legal action against that person, sue them. And as soon as I say that, the dollar signs come up. Yeah. I don't want to spend the money. Well, if you don't want to spend the money, you're not going to be able to enforce the documents. Uh, you, the association has to take a very strong approach to, well, you've got to comply with our documents. If you don't, we're going to bring legal action against you. The state's not going to make you do anything. The state's not going to say you can't park there. Or the state's not going to say you can't have a dog in your unit. State's not going to get involved in that. That's a document issue that goes through our legal system. I'd use the word sue. You, uh, you mean fine, right? Nope. Fine so, to the point where they don't pay the fines. Then you bring them to the small claims court. Okay. But still, 
even the finding process is, not, is sometimes not effective, Bruce. I'm sure you know. That's the problem, right? And we, and under statute, we have to go through the finding process. We can't sue somebody because they left their mat in front of the door. Okay. Well, yeah, but if, if you've got a person who's in violation of the documents, you send them a notice of violation, they don't correct the problem, yes, you, you can impose the fine. Uh, and um, the fines are allowed, whether they're in your documents or not. They're also limited by the statute. Uh, and there is a fining process in all three statutes, condo, co-op, and HOA. The fining process is identical. Now, for all three, uh, you have to give them a notice of violation. You have to give them an opportunity for a hearing, a 14-day uh, notice for a hearing. If they request the hearing, they can, um, they can uh, give their defense of what they're doing. If, if the hearing committee doesn't agree, they can go ahead and impose the fine, and the committee can't adjust the fine. It's either yes or no. Uh, and the committee consists of at least three people, and they say yes or no, and then once they've sit, have, said yes, we give them a notice of the fine that their fine has been imposed. They have five days to pay the fine. If they don't pay the fine, it's not lienable in a condominium. Now, a Fred, add up the number of days that you just talked about, and you're talking about probably a month. So somebody could be in violation for a month before it's corrected. And usually when it's corrected, once it's corrected, the hearing committee will say, well, now that you're corrected, you're okay. Okay, that's true. So that should be addressed about the fining process. The fine should go in, into place immediately and then uh, retroactively uh, after the hearing and everything, that time should have been accounted for, in my uh, opinion. That's a legislative change. That's an opinion, opinion. Okay. But my, you know, my thought process is if I give a person a notice of violation, my, if, if you tell me I'm in violation, I won't say, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I'm going to fix it. That's you. That should solve the problem. No, that's you. I understand. You're a good person. But, but I realize that a lot of people aren't, don't take that approach. And I, I think the, the problem that we have in condominiums uh, and co-ops is the fine is not lienable. And so if we if we said, okay, we're gonna fine you, if you don't pay, we can put a lien on your unit. That gives it a lot more teeth than, okay, we're gonna fine you, whatever. Now the other, uh, once we find them, they still don't correct the problem. They don't pay the fine. We can go to small claims court, get a money judgment, a judgment, but that still doesn't solve the problem. The ultimate solution is to take them to court. The reason that we record these documents, the Declaration of the Articles and Bylaws, the reason they're recorded in the public records is because that makes them enforceable in court. You're and correct. When they get that letter from the attorney, they usually pay up. We never get to court. They're not going to go to court for $1,000. So, so we're, we're, everything we're, we're talking about seems to go back to the documents and go back goes back to what specifically is, is mentioned for your particular association. So. Let's say we have um, uh, CCRs that are over 20 years old. They've only had two minor amendments over the years. Is it recommended to do a review and a rewrite of documents this old to bring them up to date for the community? Like how often should that take place? What are your thoughts on that guys? We, we have 44 different associations here. And about 10 years ago, we tried to make a unified document I heard Seinfeld, heard, I, Seinfeld, the writers of Seinfeld contacted you to have the content for their episodes, right? For right. All the... yeah, you're right, Jay. But <laughs> what happened was, again, we had 44 associations with different documents. So we formed a committee of association, and they took the best parts out of each one, and they put it together. Over the years, that's changed. This association modified this, another did that. We're at the time we got to do that again. Because you're right, if it's a good rule, it should apply to everybody. And, uh, and on an individual basis, if you have one association, you should uh, deal with your documents as, as much as possible. Now, Fred brings up a point we talked the other day about there should be a clause in there that if the law changes, that these automatically update to the law. Oh, yeah. That, uh, that's a very important clause. Uh, many of the modern condominium documents, and I'm speaking to condominiums only right now because that's where the, the majority of the associations are currently, but not so much in the HOL. But there's a, a clause in the documents that says, these hereby incorporate all changes made in the Condominium Act that would affect these documents. That goes a long way to, quote, 
keeping your documents updated. But if you go back to documents like in your uh, age, that are your age, uh, Bruce, and when your community was built, that language was not uh, thought of at that time. I, I recommend, absent that language, that the documents be reviewed at least every five years. Five years. In, in conjunction with the uh, changes in the laws, uh, also federal law changes, other things changing, uh, the prohibitions against discrimination, uh, also the things like that as well. And the the uh, the attorneys that I talk to and deal with uh, and go to these meetings, uh, obviously they're looking at uh, their services, but also protecting the, the uh, sanctity of the community. Uh, the, the reason we built these community associations, those documents, is to spell out what that lifestyle is going to be. Uh, we're selling a lifestyle, uh, uh, in your case, one more, the retirement communities. In our cases today, the HOAs, they're selling the amenities, uh, all the things you get when you buy there. And as time change, we need to review those documents and make those uh, uh, change them to, 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 to uh, satisfy the needs of that day, that time. Uh, so if we meet twice a year bylaws committee for the master association because of everything that's changing and uh, again it's not just the law that's changing it's we are changing and our lifestyles are changing and what was good back five ten years ago is not the same today so i would recommend that in association you should check them by end you should have a committee and they should review it maybe no changes just to read them over it's amazing how many times when you read them over again so I didn't remember that was in there, but uh, I think uh, we sh should do it twice a year, at least the board should. It's not that long. It's, the documents, at least the bylaws, is usually somewhat about 20 pages. That's a good, uh, good rule of thumb. Yeah, it's not really um, difficult reading. There's an interesting question on topic here before we go to the next topic. Um, with regards to that clause about automatically updating, uh, yeah, it was not automatically, but well, with we concurrent just, laws, they're staying updated with concurrent laws. How, how, what about ones that, that have the Kaufman language in it? That would, that's the same language. Okay. I think that's the term, Jack. Yeah. I think it's the same term. Yeah. Okay. That's the same so then, language. So it wouldn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was a question in, in our, in our pool there. The, but the, um, with regards to, oh, and I, I want to mention too, for our interactive section, I want everybody in the audience to start thinking about a little bit about some of the things you've done about dealing with COVID in your association. Uh, we're going to also touch upon term, uh, we touched upon term limits earlier. So please, uh, anything you hear today, please express your opinions into the Q&A. If it doesn't get answered live, we will address them. Uh, both Bruce and Fred will have all of the questions answered and unanswered. Uh, we'll, it, it will all be sent to them. So we will address a lot of these. And plus, even if Bruce has to leave at 11, Fred and I will stay on um, and we'll, you know, we'll get, try to get all the uh, questions answered that are in the queue if we haven't gotten to it during the main part of the presentation. So um, everything, again, that we've spoken up to at this point, um, do you think, Fred and Bruce, are CAMs and board members, are their voices being heard by the lawmakers and the lobbyists? Well, I was on the board of an organization down here and I was a little bit disappointed because I was the only manager on the board. There were other professions, lawyers. From like, like a staff. civic organization? Like the board of a civic or like a? No, a board of a property manager organization that okay. I don't want to use the. Okay, I got you, I got you. Go you got it, right? Yeah. So uh, I found that there was a conflict of interest that uh, when you're dealing with bankers and they have their own interest, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you know, they give out a mortgage, it's a bad mortgage, and who suffers? The association, because we can't collect our maintenance and we're on their time frame and we have to wait. And they're a person that's representing a property manager board and board members. I think that uh, board members and property managers need to either form their own organizations or get more involved in the existing ones. I know Fred is strong in his opinion about uh, the people that are actually serve on the boards. But I remember I brought up a situation one and I really didn't get an answer. I was told to form a, if we want to form a subcommittee on issues, we can form a subcommittee. I, I knew that there was something wrong at that point. I did, and I'll just give you this because it's one of my pet peeves. Uh, the association has a bulk cable contract. 
and a unit owner is not paying their maintenance. And we found out that we're not allowed to turn off their cable, okay? Why? And the, re the reasoning was because if there's an emergency or they have to be notified, they need their television for that. Well, if you buy that or not, that's up to you, but I don't buy that. And so- You can make them buy one of those antennas that get the- uh, off of the <laughs> Buy a transistor radio for five bucks is one of those weather radio. But it's, it, that's insult on injury. A person's not paying their maintenance and they're watching uh, HBO all day. You know, I don't want to sound insensitive, but things have to be fair. And I really didn't think that was fair. I understand that the cable has a large lobby and they don't want to start getting into where you take their bulk contracts and start making exceptions. So then the association can say, give us a credit for that portion. And it could get a little messy. And uh, I just thought the answer was not correct. And it wasn't like anybody was fighting for us to say, you know what? Maybe they'll pay the maintenance if we're not that 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 feasible to me. That you know, we not that nice to them. Uh, well, I've also um, observed that to, to to answer your or address your question, Jeff. Uh, no, uh, the community association management profession does not have a voice that is being heard by the legislature. We participate in other entities that are speaking, but they're speaking from their perspective, not necessarily the community association manager perspective. Uh, all too often, and I've observed this over the years, uh, managers don't know that there's proposed legislation until it's passed. And once it's passed, it creates a burden for them or more burdens for their association uh, that going to increase their cost and the association costs as well. I'll give you an example. There's a bill uh, sitting in the legislature right now. It hasn't passed, but it's being considered uh, that would greatly increase the burden on management and indirectly the associations as well and providing records upon request from an owner. Uh, and you're going to have to keep detailed records of what you provided uh, all sorts of additional costs involved in that as well. Uh, I think it's a, a terrible bill from the, for the association and management uh, to place an additional burden on that person. And it all comes about because of the owners who request records and they don't get exactly what they want or, or, or they've got what, what the records are, but those records don't reflect exactly what they want to see. Uh, so they keep requesting and requesting and requesting more and more. And this created a big burden. I'm sure, Bruce, you all face this in your association with many units that you have. Uh, we hear this across the board and from the uh, complaints received by the department, uh, uh, for, by the Division of Florida Economy and Timeshares and other ones. Uh, access to records is the biggest complaint. Uh, that's the one they get more complaints about than anything else. And it's not because we're trying to hide the records. It's very many times because the... Uh, the owners are being abusive and trying to find out uh, something or trying to justify something that's happening or, or not happening uh, to, to satisfy their needs. Uh, and I, I think those are things that managers should have a voice in and say, wait a minute, that's not necessary. For, you know, Fred, two things we're, that. we're passing laws to address the bad apple. The big, the big in the big bucket, they're, they're good apples. Uh, but, yeah, Fred, there's two things that. If a community discloses information uh, early, you're not going to have that problem with people asking for records. And it's because our community, it isn't. We get it from one or two, and they're basically looking at it for a, their own agenda to say, I got you. These are I got you people. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing the right thing, you're not going to get records for uh, particular things uh, if it's all documented and disclosed properly. So how do you deal with the I got you people who are just wasting your time and uh, they never hit the target. It's just we're spending a lot of time on them. And I'm talking about out of 8,000 people, maybe one or two yeah, at, a time, at a time. Is it possible, is it possible I mean, transparency is a good thing, put stuff out there. Is it possible to over-communicate? Can, can a community over-communicate? Uh, there are certain things that should be, whether it's lawyer, client privilege, that stuff you should, but you need to communicate that that's what it is. 
but we found out a long time ago. We tell them everything we know. We're not hiding anything. There's nothing too high, right. okay? When you try, if you have some bad news and you hold it back, it just builds on your shoulders and uh, takes you down. If there's a problem, problems can be fixed, okay? Right. We don't make mistakes. We make adjustments here. So you, you say what the situation is. I didn't create the hurricane. I didn't create this situation. You talk about it. You plan it out. And if you plan well, you have nothing to hide. That's really it. And you shouldn't get many request records. Right. And again, we're just dealing with the people, the difficult people that are looking for something so they can say, they can kick your shin. Right? That's really what the type we get. But I don't know what your experience with your other clients is. And I, agree, I agree with that uh, also, Bruce. It's usually a small, uh, small percentage of the population that have problems or agendas that create the problems. And that's why I'm so, what I'm saying is, why should we address those people that create the problems when they're a very small percentage and with the right number of people happy? And I always like to, I've always expressed this in our uh, continuing education programs, I, when we do the management portion, uh, the definition of management, one of the processes of management is evaluating how well you did. Uh, and uh, in the community association world, we evaluate how well we did based on the feedback we get from our owners. Unfortunately, how much feedback do we get? Yeah. People that are happy, we don't hear anything. All the people we we'll hear from, generally speaking, are those that are unhappy. And, uh, that's, that's a fantastic point because with a lot of the stuff that I do running board meetings for various condos and HOAs throughout the state via Zoom and such, my gosh, we hear I hear the board numerous times. They'll mention things like, nobody ever shows up to our meetings. Why, can't, why is it always the same 20 or 30 people? They're the only ones who care. That's not true. They're not the only ones who care. If you're routinely having hundreds of people coming to your board meetings, you're probably not doing something right. Is it right? There's a magic number. You don't want too many. You don't want too little. But right. the, this, you know, uh, we mentioned something before about um, a term limit. Right. Yes. Again, the people that can't get elected for the one or two the positions as officers are the ones that are requesting this type of information, from my experience, because they're kicking the shins of the people that they can't get out of office. So they try to result, let's have term limits so we don't have to deal with those people. And I could be in that seat because 90, the majority of the people like what's going on and it frustrates them because they are now with the community agenda. Well, I've always said that if you don't hear from them, they're happy. The what's that? If you don't hear from them, they're happy. Yeah. If we only hear from the unhappy people. No. Yeah, and if you don't yeah, hear from them, it, does, it doesn't mean they don't care. And it, you can't it, take it personal because it's not personal. It's, it's, their, yeah. it's their problem, not yours. You're not doing it. If you're doing everything right, you can't take it like, get. you can't use the emotion of anger. Or you just have to say, you know what? I have to deal with it. Yep. And I, I like to say also, and I, we jokingly say people don't read the documents before they buy. Oh, most people do read the documents before they buy, and they like it. They like the protections built into the documents. And if that if everything's going fine, they're not going to say anything. It's not when, the majority. Yeah. When something not bothers them, that's when they speak up. Yeah. I, and I have to. I always. Uh, I like to remind my managers: don't let those people who are complaining control your time. Uh, they'll, they'll utilize. Easy for you to say. I spend most of my time on, I spend 90% of my time on 10% of the people. Exactly. Right. And how about the, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Right. Uh, as uh, you know, I'm picking on something, but I'm not picking on the activity I like, but I'm picking on this activity I don't like. And it's just so out there that people see this. And it's, it gets to a point of, uh, yeah, but. And, uh, that's just an observation, like I said, uh, if we evaluate, we have to evaluate our success and uh, look at the people that are happy, not the unhappy people. You're right. We, we, we focus on the negative. That's where we spend our attention. And, and unfortunately, that goes back. That's what the legislation focuses on. Uh, they're, they're always addressing that one issue that one person wasn't happy about. Yeah, or one board member stole some money in Miami and the whole state has to... Uh, suffer for exactly, exactly, and uh, anyway, 
That goes back to the representation or the camps going or the camps being heard. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't think the cams are speaking. Uh, if they did, they might be heard. But until there's some uh, centralized uh, body, and I don't want to call it a organization or whatever, the centralized voice uh, that will speak for the cams, mm -hmm. then uh, they're not going to be heard in Tallahassee. We're still going to be reacting. But the reality is to get funding and compete with the other, uh, our adversary groups on certain issues, it, it would be a tremendous feat. Yeah, it, it, it boils down to money, uh, bottom line. Uh, you have to have an organization that's going to have to raise money. And whether we like it or not, uh, laws are passed based on uh, the lobbying that goes on in Tallahassee. And the lobbyists are paid money. Uh, and the organization sometimes have people that do that as well. But that's the reality of the uh, situation. That's how legislation gets passed. Right. And the condominium is usually on the suffering end. Mm -hmm. Yes. The way I see it when it comes to certain things like financial issues. And one, one other real quick topic on that uh, as well. And I, I mentioned this for condominiums. I realize we have also all, all different types of associations here. Uh, the condominium world uh, had a lot of legislation passed three years ago, uh, imposing all these additional requirements. There's a proposal in the legislation right now that would create another leg uh, regulatory body within the Division of Florida Condominiums, Time Shares, and Mobile Homes to investigate fraud in condominiums hmm. and expand, expand that uh, monetary uh, protection, fraud, and everything like that, and authorizing all these additional bodies to do that. But guess what? What? No more money. Oh. It's, it's not going to raise the condominium filing fee. Filing fee was last raised in 1992. Well, do you remember a few years ago they wanted to just deregulate the oh, yeah. provision? Yeah. Completely? So they keep going back and forth. They get but, loose, they get strict. But I, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that legislation, except we should not pass legislation unless we provide funding for it. And they're, you know, they're, unless they're going, to, they're going to provide funding for that, all that does is to, to, it diminishes the division's ability to carry out their job. That's why today, when you file a complaint as a condominium owner, you don't hear anything for 60 or 90 days. It takes that long for them to, to, to catch up. Uh, and there's a, a, totally a lack of funding. So if we want regulation, we have to pay for it. If we don't want to pay for it, we shouldn't have regulation. So isn't it also true that the money that we pay in the four dollars per unit can use for other things? Uh, legislature can sweep that money. Yeah. So yep. it's possible. So. Yeah. Hmm. But that's my, my legislative soapbox for the today. I'm not <laughs> well. Uh, no, there's a there's a main condominium units in the state of Florida, and we should have more soon. We really should. So guys, are there any other topics that we want to touch upon before? Because I really want to get some audience participation with the uh, hand raising feature. Anything we want to mention before we start opening it up live to some audience participation vocally? Go for it, it's hard, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm... All right, so on the lower center portion of your screen, folks, uh, you have a little hand raising icon. If you'd like to ask a question of Bruce and Fred, uh, use that hand raising icon. I'll enable your microphone and you will be heard. Uh, anything goes. Uh, the items we talked about today, maybe you want to share something, a frustration, an accomplishment about what you did with COVID in your association, how you handle a particular situation. Maybe you're having issues with selective enforcement. Uh, anything goes. This is what we're here for. We want to, this is the beginning of your cam voices being heard. We want to be a part of that with you, and, and who knows where this can go. We have one person thus far. I'm going to allow this person to speak. Diana. I know Diana. I haven't seen her in about five years. <laughs> your mic has been enabled. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, hi. Um, just wanted to, to, you know, I love everything that everyone said here. It's great. Uh, I really believe in what Fred is saying and Bruce about advocating. And I know that I heard you say, uh, Bruce, about uh, and Fred about the, you know, people have all the money, the lobbyists. But aren't isn't 
aren't the constituents or like a cam if we got together and owners aren't our voices louder as advocates because louder than a paid lobbyist because we're actually uh, the voice of 40 each one of us so if you have 10 times 40 you know isn't that the way to start this grassroots Diana I know you from uh, your work with the law firm and you could help us organize because you've done this before this is your forte isn't it yes and I love it <laughs> are you volunteering well, I'm happy to help. I'm happy. Okay, to get a number, Jeff. <laughs> Let me, uh, Diane, Diane, I agree with you 100%. That's how it starts. Uh, I want to reflect very quickly of my experience with that uh, all the way back in 2003. Uh, there was a proposal uh, while Governor Bush was in office. He was, he was a deregulation person. And there was a proposal to eliminate uh, the community association manager license. And at that time, and it had some pro serious traction initially. Uh, that's right, Fred, but before I just want to interject real quick, keep that train of thought. When I'm not in South Florida, I'm in another state. I'm in the Birmingham, Alabama area. In this state, you don't have to have a cam license. Correct. And it, go, go ahead. Anyway, but anyway, there there was a, a proposal, uh, and uh, um, we a group of us. Uh, formed an organization for like, uh, the Florida Community Association Management Council or uh, something where it was. Uh, we solicited memberships. Uh, we uh, hired a lobbyist. We had a voice. We were successful. And we tried to keep that organization uh, running uh, after about three years. Uh, nobody wanted to participate because we didn't have an issue. Uh, so. But it takes more than the managers, as you brought up, Diana. It would take um, it would take the the uh, residents of the condominiums, the HOAs, mm -hmm. to get involved, uh, to look out for their well-being, uh, and not relying on the legal profession, the bankers, and all those others. The, de the developers are the ones that control the HOA world right now. Uh, and have stopped the, all the regulation for that world. I'm not I'm not a proponent for regulation. I'm just making an observation about how things happen in Tallahassee. And mm -hmm. you does take a voice and there's nothing that says we can't have a ground, uh, a grassroots voice doing that as well. Board members and residents, yes. they have an interest. Their okay. homes and uh, they're the ones being affected. Property managers, we take it as our profession. We're dedicated. We'll be there, but we have to hear from the people that actually live in the association. And it's interesting, Bruce and Fred, with this, because I know that I touch a lot of people with what I do with elections, with my election business. And when I hear the owners, whether they're on the side that got on the board or is not on the board, it doesn't matter. There's one thing that resonates is that they are exactly what Fred says, reactive and not proactive. And with what you just said, Fred, where if there's not an issue, nobody is aware and there's nothing else, you know, no one's really active anymore. We can continue being active by monitoring legislation and tracking it every year and uh, creating that urgency that if we are not watchdogs for our own professions and for our own communities and our own assets, that we will not have the opportunity to be proactive. So legislation didn't just start this year for those, as Fred mentioned, those department divisions that they're trying to create to, you know, where there's no money in the department and it's being thrown out there to pay for it and to monitor it. There isn't any money as there is to really monitor any of the arbitration and complaints that are filed right now. Um, they take, as Fred said, a long time before you even get an answer to respond a response to your complaint or your so if we're creating that urgency and keeping people engaged that hey we still need you to pay attention and monitor this so that none of this happens going forward and that we're tracking it three years in advance when it's first being like thrown out there and tossed around versus uh now um where it's in this legislation right now in those two bills Another thing that's important to remember is that grand jury report from 2017. It didn't just start in 2017. It started five years before that with people who were complaining in Doral and Miami and those areas. And many of them are people who didn't make it 
on a board and they continue forward and there's a group that they formed themselves and they're on the side of the problems that we, not the problems, but the issues that we that are doing as the good actors or the good apples in the bunch, as Fred said, need to monitor and make sure there's a balance. So there's a checks and balance at all times for us. And that is how we're going to make that difference. And in this, in our profession to continue to increase the professionalism and to increase it with our board members so they understand there's more to it than just running your association. It's being active in every, every aspect that you can in your city, your local city, and also your state. So I'm going to get off my soapbox, but you know, I'm very passionate <laughs> about it. Bruce, you've known me for many years and Fred because, and Bruce. So anyway, I won't ask any more questions or take your time, but I got to tell you, I love what's going on here on this gray area. So thank you both for doing this for all of us CAMs and board members. I just got elected on the board of my community last night. <laughs> so take, you know, a picture I am of your, take a picture of your smile today and then take a picture of your smile <laughs> yeah. a year from now. Oh, no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> thank you, Diana. Thanks a lot. And you were very accurate in all that all you said. Uh, I want to mention one thing. I got one of the questions in the Q&A, uh, Jeff. There's legislation uh, in, being proposed right now, uh, being considered in Tallahassee, that would allow uh, open investing of reserve funds uh, by qualified uh, investment managers, whatever. I think that take, needs to be examined very closely. Uh, we're dealing with every, everybody's money. There's a fiduciary responsibility uh, on the part of the board to protect that money. I realize a, there is a, a, a great, uh, uh, I guess, attraction to being able to take that reserve money out of a CD and put it in uh, to the stock market because we're a booming stock market. But there's also a great uh, uh, responsibility for loss there as well and possibility of loss. And we're dealing, it's like, it's, it's like a trust fund. The reserve money is a trust money. We're giving it to the association in trust. They're going to keep it for our benefit so they can replace the roof or resurface the pool or paint the building. When the time comes, I don't have to come up with more money. And I think that opening that up to investment uh, options would be uh, detrimental to the long-term needs of the association. And you know the three rules that you teach. Number one, security of fund. Number two, the liquidity. And third and least is rate of return. And you're right, it's not our money and we don't want to buy junk bonds. And next thing we know, it's time to do the roof and uh, our assets have been reduced by 45%. And I, that's, uh, that, that was my thought as well. And I know uh, as an investor, I've got some risky money, but most of it's in security, secure uh, investments. So I don't want to keep it that that's way. It's personal, right? Yep. That's personal. Right? That's, what, that's personal, right. But anyway, I, I mentioned that question came up on the on the uh, Q and A, Jeff. Uh, pardon me for looking at it, but I did as well. Uh, and we oh, will get to all of them, I promise. Okay, all right. But uh, thank you, Fred. No, that's a good point. Um, I have uh, one. We have somebody. Uh, we have a, a caller on the line. I'm going to okay. Teresa. Uh, enabled your mic. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question of Fred and Bruce. Um, I am the vice president in an HOA, and we had some incidences way back when where um, some homeowners were granted forgiveness with certain things that should be violations. So some of these violations go back to like 2015. If they're still there, is there a time limit that we can go back and issue the violation, like say an RV's been parked there for two years or a shed, are, are we limited to a year or two years or can I go back and start issuing violations for those? Retroactively? Well, or, you, the, or you just haven't collected the money? Well, the violations were never issued. Like one property has a shed where it was denied by the architectural committee, but they put the shed in anyway. And we just now basically, we know it's been there, but can we go back if that shed's been there since 2015, 
can we do a violation on it? Are we limited? Is there a time limit saying it's been there since 2015 and we just have to ignore it? Is it grandfathered almost like, almost in? like a statute of limitations type of yeah. scenario. That's, that's my question. Or is it there, grandfathered there, in also? There, it, was, there's a in that. it was never approved. That, but that, there, there, here's the problem. This is one of the issues that I mentioned a little bit earlier about enforcing the documents. If you fail to take action in the documents, you risk the losing the ability to enforce that provision. One of the problems you have now is that you've allowed that shed to remain there for five years. No one's taken any action on it. Uh, most likely, if you went back and tried to take action on that now and you wound up in court, you're in an HOA, so you have no other recourse but go to court, the court's going to rule that your failure to enact that or to uh, yeah, to enact that provision when you found out about the violation is going to pr uh, basically prohibit you from enforcing it in the future. It's called equitable estoppel. Uh, and that's a problem. Now you can go through a process and you're gonna have to get engaged attorney to do this, whereby the board can adopt a resolution and send out a notice to all the owners and say, we are going to enforce this from now on. And you're not gonna be allowed to do this. Uh, such as place a shed on your property as well. Uh, and putting them on notice, also providing that language from your documents as well. And again, you need to get an attorney to uh, go through that process with you uh, to, re to re reactivate those restrictions that are out there. But to, to be able to go back now and make that person remove that shed is going to be uh, difficult if, if it's impossible. Uh, but there, the board can what we call reactivate those provisions as well. And there's a legal process you go through to do that. And you should deal with your association attorney to do that. And I, that's one of the problems I was talking about earlier, because if you don't enforce the documents, you, fail, you have the risk of losing the ability to enforce the documents in the future. I don't know if that doesn't, it doesn't solve your problem, but I hope that it shows you a way to, to, to do that in the future. Much appreciated, thank you. You're quite welcome. Very welcome. It's almost like um, it's almost like rewarding a pet who bites somebody. You don't want to do that because then you you can never train the pet to do the right thing or to behave in a certain way. So I understand the point you were making, Fred. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. A gentleman named a person named Jeffrey. Jeff, Go ahead and unmute yourself. Your mic has been enabled. Are you still there? Um, one of the things, uh, you talk about legal issues, <clears throat> and, and it, it does cost the association <clears throat> a lot of money sometimes to, to prosecute some of these uh, violations. And the thing about it is you have to have the money up front. Uh, and if you win, of course, you will get some of that money back when the, uh, if the judge rules that you get a fee award. And that really makes it difficult, I think, for associations I'm trying to move forward to to sue on some issues. We've spent probably over thirty thousand dollars in the last couple of years to uh, sue this one guy because he had, did not maintain his house. The stucco was falling off the back of his house because he had wood rot behind it, and he wasn't doing anything about it. And of course, we decided to act because if you don't act uh, on the provision of our documents, which say that all owners should maintain their property and fix it promptly. And we would lose the ability in the future uh, to to uh, actually enforce that part of the, of the covenants. That meant, of course, we do have an award coming back, so we have a hard, hard time collecting that. So it seems like it, we get it's so hard to spend. You know, it's so hard to move forward to spend the money to do this stuff, especially when your budget doesn't account for something like that. And that's one of the things I've tried to tell my owners of my two associations is that's why you have to have a large owner's equity fund, which accounts recommend that your owner's equity should be 25% of your annual income. So that you have a little bit of money to go back on. I'm not talking about reserves. I'm talking about extra money that's in your operating fund that you haven't spent from prior years and have not dedicated to an actual expense item or a reserve. And uh, I would have really liked to have had, well, we had maybe half of that amount of money. We'd like to have more if I could. 
Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, we sympathize with you because really what you're saying is you're spending good money chasing bad money. And the process is so long that the amount that you can spend on collection fees offsets what you're trying to accomplish in the first place. And it's a discouragement to board members to say, how much money are we going to spend, if I, if I got you correctly, how much money are we going to spend on this? And where does it end? And what are we going to get back? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a matter of time. And this can go on 18 months, 24 months, three years. If I got you correct, what we did here at Winmore, we have a, an attorney of collection that we're on retainer. And he does all this at one price. So retainer for the whole community. So we're not paying the hourly fee. And it's really made a big difference because when it was the hourly fee, directors were hesitant to go to the collection attorney because it was just going to cost them too much money. And uh, Fred, I, I, if I got this correctly, I would think that this is, again, who's running the roost here? If we have legal people, is it in their interest to make the process shorter and simpler that you owe money, you need to pay, get it over with? Instead of this, between the banks and the legal, the next thing you know, you got a bill of $20,000 collecting uh, $2,800 on maintenance, but you had to do something because you had to stop the bleeding. Right. Is that correct, Jeff? Yeah, that's good. Well, Jeff's, Jeff's is using a little more, a little more specific, I think. You know, this is what I was talking about earlier, Jeff, and uh, I appreciate it. Well, you've got a person who's not in compliance with the documents yeah. and not maintaining their uh, unit or their house or parcel, wherever it should be, yeah. and, not, and that detracts from everybody else's value as well. Uh, how much money do we spend to make that person comply? Uh, and uh, even if we get part, all or part of it back, it's upfront money. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Quite often, the when I say to my in my discussion with people, well, you've got to go to court. Well, we can't go to court. We don't have any money. Right. You don't have any money. You can't go to court, so you can't solve the problem. Right. So what you need to do is increase your assessments, and as you said, uh, build up what I call working capital our operating capital, it's not a reserve item, it's there for the association uh, contingency account or stick it in there, legal fees, whatever, but put some more money in there that you can use uh, because what you're doing is you're protecting the value of all the other parcels. Everybody's value is impacted by one owner's failure to maintain. And if the association doesn't take uh, uh, reasonable action to make that person comply, then We've got the further step. Now the board may be liable and we could face a fiduciary responsibility suit. You didn't properly make that person comply. That's cost me money on my house because my values diminished. And so are you liable for my loss of value? So it's catch 22. And I agree with you. It's quite a common problem. But there's no only solution to it. Again, it goes back to money, unfortunately. Uh, and be willing to spend that money. And, and thanks for sharing that because that is a chronic uh, problem out there as well. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah. And we're getting close to the, to the top of the hour. So um, as I mentioned, we're gonna stay on a little bit longer um, and, and try to get to, there aren't that many questions left in the queue. There's only about nine or 10 of them. So maybe we can do a rapid fire and uh, Fred and Bruce, just feel free to, to chime in. Uh, one of them, the first one is, are penalty late fees not applied to late assessments due to COVID? I'm not a no. No. Status, no. no, there's no relief in the statute. No. There's been no relief because of the emergency state of emergency. Uh, some associations have, they do have the power to uh, waive late fees uh, in certain circumstances. So the assessor, that, that's an association decision. No. Board by board. We've been very fortunate with our collections. COVID has not affected us, yeah. but we don't advocate to take anything off the books until everything's settled and see where we are. Yes. yes. The next one in our rapid fire, is there a difference between COAs and HOAs that permit short-term rentals versus long-term rentals? Special requirements that may play in on short-term rental permissions and properties. I think we talked about that when we talked about the short-term rental earlier. A little bit. Uh, Real rentals are covered by your documents. Uh, the documents are going to specify terms or whatever it might be. The biggest problem is where the, the documents do not say anything 
about renting. When they don't say anything about renting, then an owner can do pretty much what they want to with their property if there are no restrictions. Get they, that language in there. You know, yeah, the qualification is if you don't have restrictions on there, uh, put those restrictions, amend your documents to provide for restrictions, whatever you want to provide for, recognizing those restrictions won't apply to anybody who's against it. Okay, so that's <clears throat> the, the issue with the short term sure, long term rules. <laughs> This next one I know is going to uh, touch Bruce as well. To remove community association and go self-managed. I, mean, I guess they mean management company. To remove a management company and, and become self-managed, does it require a vote of owners or is the board member vote sufficient? Well, that'd be a membership vote, but I don't. Let me give you our situation. And I don't think anybody that can go back and have your documents changed. When we were created, we were created as a not a management company, but we work directly for the residents. So uh, I am their only employee, and I and I run this what we call the community council, and we're paid by the residents of Winmore. And uh, we've been talking with Century Village because they're trying to do that because in Century Village they have I think over two hundred and fifty. Uh, associations that have their own management within them. That means you probably have about 30 landscapers, whatever. What we now, did in the beginning is we, we co op we, we may have people joining us from the Panhandle who don't know what, what a central okay. village is. Another, another retirement village. Uh, <laughs> they, they're all, every association does their own thing. When we were established, we co opt between our 44 different village associations and we formed this master company but we're not a ma master management. We're just another corporation that was created by the residents here. And they pay a separate fee to us for all the common stuff, such as the theater and the clubhouse and the golf course and the buses. But anything in their village, we have another agreement with them also where we do their landscaping, their building maintenance and other situations. So we're very unique. We're very lucky. And... Um, I hope I answered that question, but to, to change. And I want to expand on that a little bit. Uh, that question with the way it was asked, I think it might be, be, be a different type of community than Winmore. But your typical condominium, HOA, association, whatever it might be, if they engage, it's a, it's a board's option. Uh, the board is a body responsible for managing the affairs of the community association, whether it's a condo, co-op, HOA, whatever it might be. Uh, and depending on the documents as well, but typically, the board, as the body responsible for managing, may decide to engage professional management. They can hire an individual as an employee. They can go out and engage a management company. Uh, that's normally a board decision. Uh, likewise, the board can terminate management, obviously in keeping with the terms of the contract that uh, they're entered into. Uh, so normally the engagement or change- and Meaning, and you mean going from a management company to somebody like Bruce? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. You, could, you could terminate management company. I'm not a company. I actually work for the corporation. Or, the manager, or they could they could fire their manager and hire a management company. Okay. The board normally makes that decision. Now, it's got a little bit different arrangement that goes back to the documents again. Uh, it's, it's all a document issue. But the more traditional situations, rather than one more, the board decides if they're going to have management and if they do have management, whether it's going to be an employee relationship or whether it's going to be a management company. That's an operating issue, right? But not a policy issue. Right. So this one is going back to an earlier topic we covered when we were talking about board members that aren't participating or, or not getting involved or, or on there for the, his or her own agenda. What about committee members that, that do not have the community's interest first? How would you... I would assume committees report to the board, so I would I would assume the board can replace said committee member. How do you, how do you guys feel about that? Well, in our case, the committee reports to the president of the association. Okay. And therefore, it's at that person's pleasure. And you know what, Jeff, you're getting into difficult territory here because if if you take somebody off that is aversive, then they're going to go out and say they don't want to listen to what we have to say. Right. Well, you keep your friends close. You keep I your enemies close. I wanted you to say that. I mean, right. I, 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 and I, I, you know what? You, you deal with it. And if they're really out of line, people stop listening to them. It just happens that way. But okay. it, it's an issue. Again, people are the hardest problem we have here. Uh, I've always said this job would be real easy if nobody lived in these communities. 
<laughs> here's a, this, the, here's a quick one. Go real quickly about the committee. Yeah. You know, there are different situations. Again, going back to your documents, what, what in your documents, uh, which body creates the committee? It's usually a committee created by the board or by president or whatever. Whoever created that committee can change it. And if, they, if you have a person who's not productive on a committee, there's nothing says they can't be removed from the committee by whoever put them there. It would not, re normally, it would not require a membership vote or anything like that. It could be done by whoever created, created that com committee. Okay, okay. We have a hand raise. I'm gonna take this person. Uh, this person also has a question in the queue. So I'm assuming it's going to be related about HOA meeting minutes. David, this is the rapid fire session. So after you ask your question, I will then disable your mic and let Fred and Bruce answer. So go ahead and ask your question, please. And go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Welcome. Okay. My question. Hey, welcome. Um, enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for doing this. Uh, my question, which is in the queue, is how important are the? I'm in a small HOA, uh, 30 units, be simple properties, not a condo and uh, in florida and my question is how important are the minutes um for the association and are there any um besides the legal guidelines that i can read in uh, florida's 720 any uh, standards on what should be in the the minutes of board meetings Thank you, David. I'll answer that from a condo point of view, uh, President, if it's different in HOA, just let us know. David, your meeting should be very specific and not about Sally said this or Joe said that. It should be the date of the meeting, who attends the meeting, approving the minutes from the last meeting, any agenda items that you voted on, and, and that's it. You want to keep the less, the less is better because attorneys, the first thing they do when they have a case is they go to your minutes. And it says here, Joe notified everybody that we had a problem in the building. And then the lawyer said, ah, oh, got you. You don't want that in the minutes. So uh, well, yeah, my president just walked in and she's smiling because she knows that's a, a big thing our attorney always tells us. Because yeah. they take that little disc and they put it in your computer and they look for a particular word and then you just you hurt yourself and you don't need to do it. The object is, what do we vote on? How was the vote? Goodbye. And that's what I was alluding to earlier with the over communication point that I was attempting to bring up. And that, that's a perfect example right there. And with what you just said uh, about meetings and, and, and votes, one of the questions here is a no response to a vote considered a no vote. Well, oh, yeah. So we had that too here. Um, it counts. No, it's not, it used to be. It's not counted as anything. They, they changed the law here. Uh, you abstain. If you're not, it counts as an abstain. In the, in the past, an abstain was counted as a positive vote. Now it's, it doesn't count as a vote, period. It goes towards the quorum. So if you need a quorum, it's part of the quorum. Fred, you looking a little puzzled there. But if there's 10 people, one doesn't vote then it's eight to one and one abstain. In the past, it used to be nine to one, right? Yep. And, but anyway, if, if somebody doesn't vote, whether it's a board meeting, a membership meeting, whatever, uh, it's just not a vote at all. It's not yes or no. Right, but it caps toward the quorum. Yep. Okay. Okay. So Fred, uh, if, a owner, if, a, if an owner voted against a rule and then they pass, are there children who inherit the unit still exempt from following the disputed rule? Well, first of all, if, if, if which we talk about a rule, that's the board rule and regulation. If you're talking about an amendment to the bylaws, right. it doesn't matter if they voted yes or no. If, they, if that amendment passed, everybody's subject to the amendment, that amendment. Now, well, if I'm a smoker and my kids take over my unit, can they smoke in the unit? If we passed it, that no smoking? Uh, That's really what the question is. No, wait, 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 wait. 
Now, if you're talking about a grandfather provision, okay, or if, 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 you, if you pass a, an amendment that prohibits smoking within anywhere in the property, but you grandfather somebody who smokes in their unit. Well, not grandfather. You said that uh, they don't have, because they're in it, they don't have to follow the rule of smoking. No. No, I said that that's a that's a problem. I didn't say that was the case. Okay. See, no, the the question is, it's only if, if the rule actually passed. Okay, if the vote passed and it became and it became part of the rules or the document. The question was if, it, and I and I, I'm not sure if the person asked the question with the with the proper wording. If an owner voted against a rule and then they pass, we still don't know at this point if the rule pass if the rule itself passed or not. If the voter voted against a rule and then they pass, are there children who inherit the unit still exempt from following the disputed rule? Well, that all depends if the rule is disputed or not. If it's not a rule yet, I assume that they well, could still do it. They're using terminology rule. Uh, right. Fred's not using rule. He's using amendment to the bylaw. Amendment. There's right. a big difference in a rule and that. Fred, you want to... Yeah, the, the, the problem is, and that's clarification. Uh, right. it, I think we're talking about an amendment to the documents. Right. That depends on how that what that amendment impacted. Uh, for example, I mentioned earlier the uh, statute, condominium statute, says any uh, restrictions on rentals, any amendments that restrict rentals, apply only to those who vote for that amendment and all future owners. So in that case, it would apply to whoever owned that unit if that was a restriction on rentals. My example about smoking was not that was not. An example, but a question: If I if I if I have a dog right now, and the association passes an amendment to the document that says we're going to prohibit dogs, then in that situation, I'm grandfathered in with my dog until my dog expires. Now, how about your children? But my children don't get the dog right. No, they're buying it subject to those documents that are in place at the time they bought it, or inherited it, or acquired however they acquired ownership. So transfer of title is the important part of your team. Yes. Right. And that would and that would be the that would be the switch which cut it off. Cut it off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you recommend this is a, a simple, uh, pretty quick answer, I think, for the rapid fire. Do you recommend using an attorney to approve or deny an animal request? Not a, I wouldn't do it on each one, but they should set a protocol and uh, you should have it by your attorney that says, we we need this this and this from the doctor and these are the rules and and yeah. you need to get the shots it should be there but for each individual i wouldn't do it. I, I agree with that i think every every association that's facing this should consult with an attorney and get the procedure policy here's the document you have to file uh one problem is you can say you can you fill this document out they can fill out something else but have something in place uh blessed by the attorney and use that because they're going to make sure you comply with both uh, federal requirements and state requirements. Okay. And this one is related. Um, do tenants with ESA animals have to submit their credentials every year or just once? I guess it's for the life of that particular. Yeah, that's animal. a good question. Like, how long do you need an emotional pet? Is it a lifetime thing or do you get reevaluated? And I think right, we... right, now, right now, once you have that approval, it's valid until they change. They meaning the person. Yeah. Or the, or it's the like a lifetime approval, bro. It's not like it's, every it's, year it's you got to get a new note from the doctor. One time. One time. Doing. Unless that's a good point, Jeff. That's uh, something. Unless their condition changes, whatever it might be. They only have to get it approved one time. It's not an annual approval. It's not uh, anything like that. It's, it's a one-time approval. Okay. But that might be something that should be looked into because you well, may have a situation they're, they're, now that changes. They're, they've been talking about that um, as well, but right now it's one time. Okay. And I'm uh, just going to apologize ahead of We're running over. Just a few more questions. If you need to go, we understand. We're so happy you joined us on a Friday. Thank you for joining us. Great crowd today. Um, here's a question at the bottom, which may be more of it seems like something that maybe Bruce can shed some light on if you if you face this situation before. If we have a new person moving in and they are smoking marijuana and have medical marijuana and the smell is affecting the neighbor, have you? I don't think you smoke medical. We I don't think you smoke medical marijuana. We've never had that situation. 
Uh, you have the, if, if we smell marijuana, the best thing to do, it's not an association situation. It's a it's criminal situation. Call the police. Don't call your association manager. You smell marijuana and you think it's illegal, call the police. But medical marijuana is ingested, Jeff. I don't think you smoke. Not that I know. Not that I know. No, I think Personally. Pretty, Fred, Fred, I'm pretty sure it's both. I would just say get edibles. They, but, uh, they, the, the state recently, uh, the court held that uh, the legislature, what was it, executive order, could not limit that to just uh, ingesting. So it is now available in the smoking part. That goes back to the same concept with with uh, smoking in a unit affecting your neighbor, same thing. That's a unit to unit problem. Mm -hmm. tell, tell them to uh, call the attorney or whatever it might be their own association. Association can't get involved in that. Right. I'd call the police and yeah. the laws have changed on marijuana so much in different areas where now it's like a hundred dollar fine. And, uh, well, we're not far from being recreational in Florida anyway. Not far. And um, this next one seems very specific to a particular association, but but I, I, I want you to say what I think you're going to say with regards to the answer to this one. What are your thoughts about recourse with an HOA? Okay, so we're talking HOA board president who acts and make decisions on their own without including the other board members and with the support of the community association and with the support of the manager because the association's management agreement states that they will work with one board member as a liaison to the board. And I think I know what the answer is, but who wants to? It sounds like a very adversarial thing. Where, it does. Uh, it's a it condo does. commando that doesn't want to deal with the other board members, which is not a good situation. I would say now, run for Now, the it depends on what the situation is. If it's a, a policy, it's got to be the board. But if it's an operational thing where we decided during COVID we're going to close, the, we're going to close down the pool for these hours or close down the pool, uh, I think that you make that as a managerial thing because of the situation. And that's more of operations. And he's dealing with this manager for operations. But if it's that we need to vote on something because we're, we're adding something to the community, I think he sounds like a, this person sounds like a condo commando and uh, yeah, but it's always good to get people involved. You know, again, this goes back to uh, uh, disclosure and uh, people trusting you. So, so this sounds like a trust issue. Well, well, these are two issues here. It's not unusual for a management contract, management company contract, for example, to say that all contact would be made with, for example, the president. Now, the president is not the one that's making the decisions. The board's making the decisions. If the, if the management company has an issue, do we need to do this now? If it's, a, if it's a, a normal maintenance, routine maintenance issue or something like that, where it does not uh, affect a contract, it does not affect the expenditure of funds of a decision made by the board, then obviously the president can give the manager or management company uh, direction and say, yeah, go ahead and do that. If, it's a come, if it comes back to a, a, a policy decision or a contract decision, or are we going to change money in the budget, whatever, that's a board decision. So board can, I, can I ask you a question? Because we're having this right now. And this is, I'm glad you said this. Uh, we run off board pretty well, and uh, we do everything by the book. But as the COVID has been going on, we've been changing hours of operation. And we have a board member that gets up there and says, we don't have the ability, the president, myself, and uh, the operating officers to do that. The board should, the board's responsible for everything. We should vote on everything. Well, I can't call a board meeting every 48 hours if I'm going to change an, an hour of operation. That's an operational thing. And I need to have that leverage. And they, they want the board to vote on everything. And this is a discussion we've had. And our attorney even says that, you know, the board is responsible for everything, but you got to give your manager and your president and the people that you put in place the ability to do these situations. Okay, real quickly, I can address that. Uh, there's an easy answer right now, but not the long term. Uh, right now, because you mentioned COVID and the issues going on, we are operating under, there have been since last March, over a year now, right. under the state of emergency. Yeah. All three of our laws, condo law, does have uh, boards of special emergency powers, which means the board does whatever it needs to do uh, under these situations, which means they can delegate to you 
to make those decisions on behalf of the board. That'd be quite reasonable in this situation. Now, long term, in the real world, if we're dealing with amenities, as you are, uh, your uh, rights of your owners to use the property, that would typically be, be a, a board decision. And the management can come in and say, okay, we've got uh, swimming pools open until 10 o'clock now. And we have all sorts of people complaining it's too late. Can we change it to nine? No. And the board says, okay, let's change it to nine. They're in normal circumstances. Right. Right. That's, but now, that's, yeah, now we're, I'm dealing, I'm changing things on a daily basis. And it's not like we're not reporting it. We report it to the board that we're making these changes. Yeah. And uh, everybody understands it, but we get this, well, we should raise our hands and say yes. But, you know, the board meeting usually happens days later. Board meetings are once a month. And for operational things like this, we feel we're within our rights and doing the right thing for the community by keeping us well, up. This, this is a special time, uh, you know, uh, this whole whole COVID thing has, has disrupted everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been well accepted that the, the board or in your case, management, needs to do what's, what's necessary to protect the welfare of the community and the health of the community as well. As a footnote, we have a 44 member board. I can't call them every two minutes and say, I need to do this, I need to do that. So, and the community, everybody, you know, is in favor of it. But uh, again, somebody is just saying, we're the board, we should vote on these, these issues. And we're saying, you know, everybody's informed of them, but we need to do what we need to do. Okay. And this is kind of related. Uh, these are the last, there are three more questions on here. And after that, we're already over. So we're, we're gonna end it with these three. So any new ones that come in, I'll forward them to Fred and to Bruce and uh, will be addressed via email. So the last three, um, this is kind of related to what we just spoke about. How do you address an HOA member breaking the rules? And this person kept saying, I can do what I want, I'm on the board. Um, so, uh, so like I know it's a specific thing, yeah. but, but uh, gentlemen. In that situation, it's going to take a board action. Right. Or a division, or the division. Yeah, you, uh, and we also, uh, in all these cases, I heard, saw several questions throughout the, the chat, uh, uh, Q&A, uh, about uh, problem board members. Uh, that, that, that's relative problems. They're, not, they're problems to some people, not problems to other people. Uh, all three of our condominium, association condominium co-op and HOA have a process that you can remove board members. It requires membership action. And the difficult part of it is to remove a board member requires the approval of, of at least a majority of the entire membership. Okay, and that's hard to get. It's much easier to get on the board than get get off. So that's the answer when you have rogue board members or whatever. Uh, if, if they're creating problems, they're not doing their job correctly, uh, creating issues, then we have the right to remove them. Uh, like I said, there is a process. It's a, in this, this process is found in the Florida Administrative Code for uh, communities and cooperatives. It's very specific in the HOA statute. Uh, and you go through that process and you can remove board members. That's mm -hmm. the only answer. Um, so, uh, again, I have a byproduct of this. This is like a selective enforcement. I'm the president. I could do what I want. I want to give Mrs. McGillicuddy a park an additional parking space. Do you know who store, I am? Or a storage room. I can do that because, because I'm president. I could do favors for people. It comes with the job. And that's where they get in trouble too. And that has to be addressed because when they're, it always bites you. When, when you're doing that and you find these things out later that, 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 that hinges upon selective enforcement as well. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 All right. Last one. We have our token cooperative question. There's <laughs> always a couple. Uh, so, Fred, in a co-op, documents are silent. And how, our documents are silent. And how much money can be approved by the board without consentment of the members with no emergencies? Does, does that sound like it's something that is a normal thing? Um, I saw the question. I'm not sure about uh, First of all, the board has the power to manage the affairs of the community. Uh, the board, in conjunction with uh, committee, whatever, they, they come up with a budget each year. A uh, budget sets out the monies they expect to spend on whatever those categories are. Once that budget is set up, the board can spend that money as they see fit. Uh, obviously, it has to be related to what was put into the budget, 
There's no limit on how much the board can spend at one time uh, based on uh, any uh, statutory requirements or anything like that. Uh, sometimes uh, there are limits on what the board can do as far as uh, bidding is concerned. Uh, sometimes you have to get bids before you can spend money. Uh, that's a, a, a procedural issue. There's nothing in the statute that limits how much money a co-op can spend, the board of a co-op can spend at any one time. You know, such lim no limits in condo or HOA either. Going back to documents, you could have a spending authority in your documents. Uh, the board needs to approve uh, expenditures of X amount of dollars. Uh, the manager can uh, have a dollar amount and uh, that makes it a lot easier to um... yes. sure. okay. Well, that completes our queue and what a informative, excellent session we had today. Bruce, can't thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Bruce, appreciate it. And uh, any parting words for our fellow community association manager and board member warriors out there that you wanna leave them with? Yep. You should be proud of being a property manager because you have to know so much stuff, whether it's legal, financial, human resources, contracts. It's a, it's a really good profession. Be proud and uh, let's get together and change the world. For <laughs> Maybe this is a beginning. And Fred, uh, as final always. Word, final words, or read, the, read your documents. <laughs> Who's that lovely lady behind you? It's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> for those two looking at this. This is my wife, Suzanne. Many of you have uh, visited with her. She used to travel with me when, when we traveled, did classes around the state as well. She's now a professional golfer. Uh, she plays golf every day and I pay her. <laughs> that is fantastic. And, and she's Fred, she's... Uh, one quick thing before we before we leave as well, please tell everybody who's still on the, on the Zoom right now about where they can visit to find out about the continuing education programs that Gray Systems has going as well as uh, maybe they have some information they want to pass on to aspiring CAMs on how to get your career started. Well, our website, gracesystem.com, uh, we have everything in the world there that you need to contact us. All of our programs and classes are there as well. Our publications are there. We also have a question and answer session there. You can submit questions to me on there as well. And uh, everything's there. You can also call our office. Our phone number's there as well. Uh, and it's toll free. We have great staff that takes care of you. Uh, hopefully all your education needs as well. Uh, but also, uh, if you ever need me, I'm out there as well. It's just fgraysystems.com. I welcome questions, concerns, input. We'll try to do any way we can. Excellent, excellent. Yep. Thank you so, so much. And Bruce, fantastic as usual. We know you run a tight ship over there. It's, it's one of the best and it's one of the models that I use when I work with other associations. So keep it up, fantastic. It's the place to be. Fred, Bruce, thank you so much. Thank you, and I uh, can't wait to do this again with you guys. Okay. Me too, thanks. Thank All you. Right.